Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jacob Kyle, and uh, I'm here with Dr. Kavita Chanayan. We're here today to celebrate. It's, this is a, a week of celebratory events. We're celebrating the launch of our new journal, Tarka. And uh, and uh, throughout the week, I have been interviewing and chatting to a number of the contributors. Um, and today I'm joined by Dr. Kavita Chanayan, who's a friend and faculty member of Embodied Philosophy and um, someone who uh, uh, contributed two uh, pieces, one interview format and one article to this, uh, this issue of Tarka. And so we're going to talk a little bit about um, her contributions and the larger sort of um, spirit of bhakti today. So hello, Kavita, how are you? Hi, Jacob. It's so good to be here and with everybody. It's really um, nice to see you. And I'm glad we finally worked our technical kinks out. Uh, yeah. We've gone on, you on YouTube instead of Facebook. So um, hopefully people can make it over to, to, to join in on the, on the conversation. Um, so Kavita, I wanted to explore just mentioning the two uh, articles. Well, one is an article and then one's an interview. And in the interview, um, uh, uh, we invited you to reflect on, on kind of what devotion means to you in the context of your own sadhana. And while, you know, the bhakti is often associated with the, the Vaishnava and Krishna bhakti tradition, um, I was particularly interested in, in featuring you in this issue because I know you have um, more of a Shaiva or Shakta perspective on, on devotion. So can you talk a little bit about um, what devotion means in the context of your own um, sadhana and then also maybe, you know, what bhakti more generally means, you know, outside of that Vaishnava context? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, this issue of um, bhakti being a uh, specifically Vaishnava thing is something I hadn't even heard about, you know, growing up in India. And um, I don't know why um, they, the Vaishnavites uh, might have any um, you know, claim over bhakti because uh, bhakti is the fuel of any sadhana, you know? And um, for me specifically, you know, I uh, am a, um, I'm a huge Krishna bhakta. So for me, you know, I understand the, the Vaishnava context as well, but, um, and, you know, what bhakti is for me is the fuel for practice. And if you don't love something, and I'm also a mother and a wife and, uh, and a doctor. And so anything that we do, you know, if we don't have love for it and devotion for it, um, you know, then it becomes uh, a task, a chore. And uh, for, for anything in life to be successful, right? You, you've heard of this, you need to have both devotion and dedication. Devotion comes from the heart and dedication comes from the mind and the brain and you need both. And um, so if you don't love the, you know, in the beginning, the idea of, um, of God, then in any form, then what would make you want to pursue that? You, you know, even to have curiosity, you have to have some, you know, you might begin with curiosity and then you kind of, it's when you actually fall in love with God that um, the path actually becomes more real and there is suddenly an accelerated progress. And, um, you know, I have a very long uh, history in Advaita Vedanta and studied it for several years. And, and Shankara says, you know, in, in the Viveka Churamani that um, bhakti is love for, I'm paraphrasing, but bhakti is this devotion to awareness, you know, to this higher self and um, to what we might say in the Shaiva tradition to Shiva, the ground of being. And um, because if you don't love that, then you can't, 
you know, move your attention from everything else to that. Because it's only when you fall in love with awareness or Shiva or Shakti or Krishna, whatever we want to call that, that is when you are motivated to what it, do whatever it takes, you know, whether it's waking up in the morning to meditate or to do various practices or to even fall deeply into this idea of surrender and, um, and to give in. So uh, does that answer your question? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I wanna go back to something that sort of stood out for me, which I, I loved you mentioning that you're a Krishna Bhakta as well. And and so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how, you know, especially, and I also appreciate you pointing out that this is perhaps, uh, I don't know if it's just Western or specifically American, but perhaps it has something to do with the, the history of the ISKCON movement in the United States and it's sort of, you know, emphasis on Bhakti and so people associated with that. I'm not, I'm not really sure that's just my kind of a guess. Um, but, you know, this idea that like, Oh, if I'm a Krishna Bhakta, then that you know exempts the Shaiva Bhakti. You know this I this sort of sectarian idea that one should be one or the other, and you're obviously you know a, a perfect example of of that not being true. So, is this you know how does the 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 qualities of Krishna kind of speak to you as a practitioner um, in contrast to the qualities of Shiva or the goddess, uh, for example? Like how does that how does that all reconcile with each other? You know, this idea of things reconciling is also very foreign to me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to reconcile anything. Yeah. You know? um, I can be absolutely madly in love with Krishna, which I am, and yet be a Shaiva, and yet be a Shakta, which I am. And, um, you know, it is, um, and, and if we want to look at qualities per se, right? Um, the perfect example of, um, of that would be the 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita where Krishna shows his Vishwarupa. Everything is in him, right? And then similarly, you go to the uh, Devi Mahatmyam and you have the similar thing of everything is in Devi. And you go to the Shiva Puranas and everything is in Shiva, right? So um, it, it's at any given point in time, it is... Um, what calls out to me. And, uh, and while we are here, let me also say that I am a huge uh, Hanuman Bhakta. So, um, and, and so it has never crossed my mind to, to reconcile anything, you know, and file away things neatly because um, such a thing doesn't exist. You know, yeah. my, my devotion is to divinity in whatever form. And um, many times it is myself, I'm devoted to myself, right? Because ultimately that is what we are talking about here. So- um, I really appreciate you saying that. I think that's such an important point. And I wonder if that also is partly, you know, I think, uh, would you say that perhaps that is kind of, you know, hin Hindus from India, they're not, they're not brought up with this idea that like, oh, one is this, one is that. And it's, it's sort of the kind of, the, the sort of Western academic desire to compartmentalize and understand these things in their own, you know, categories and strains and lineages that, that sort of encourages this idea that one must follow this path and be true to it as in this weird, like, you know, football team kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, to be fair, such things also exist in India and right. you know, there are the Shaivites and the Vaishnavites and in some communities, they don't even talk to each other. Oh. And, um, you know, that exists, but, but what happens, um, you know, in many, like in Sri Vidya, for instance, um, there are so many deities and, you know, there is, there's perfect um, acceptance and um, devotion to each deity um, without really thinking, well, you know, I should only be devoted to Lalita Mahatrapura Sundari because she's all encompassing and she is also Matangi. She is also Varahi. She is also Bala Tripura Sundari. So uh, she's also Shiva, you know? And so the perfect example of this is in the Lalita Sahasranama, right? The thousand names of Devi it includes everything, all the other deities as well. So, um, and you know, this, um, 
idea of practice. Now, I just want to mention one thing. When it comes to practice, however, I do agree that it's really important to dig in one spot. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, because otherwise you're digging too many shallow, you know, holes and getting nowhere. So I think with respect to practice, I think it's really important to have one core practice and then all the other things that you do are really supportive of that uh, core practice, be it mantra or whatever it may be. Um, but devotion, on the other hand, you know, it, uh, bhakti, you can play with, you know, you can be, uh, the more bhakti you cultivate, in my personal experience, more you cultivate towards, you know, various deities, um, your heart opens in unfathomable ways. Hmm. Are there also, I, I like what you were saying that it's sort of variable and does it vary sometimes depending on the type of situation that you're going through? Like, for example, you know, when you're going through hardship or sadness or heaviness of heart, is there a specific deity that tends to feel more comforting and it sort of becomes a better, I don't know, relationship to support you in that process? Or is, is that a way to think about the shifting, um, you know, bhakti representations or is it something else you know that's a good question and it really depends on who you ask you know because right. there are uh practitioners and lineages which will say okay here the remedy for this is this and the remedy for this is this deity and um and that's okay that approach is okay but um see i told you earlier i'm a mother right and so if I'm looking at myself from the, from the standpoint of my children, right? It can't be that I'm only available to them for one thing, right? So I should be available for all of their needs at all times. And they, are, they can call upon me if they're scared or if they are happy or if they are stressed or whatever it may be, mm -hmm. right? They may call me by different names ma, ma, this, ma, amma, whatever it may be, but I'm the same person. And so, you know, if we start to have these kinds of remedial kinds of relationships with deities, that becomes conditional. And here, what we are trying to do is, is break through that. Ultimately, I'm a non-dualist. <laughs> so my foundation is in non-dual shakta and shaiva tantra. And so, that makes no sense to me. You know, it's uh, ultimately there is only one. And, and whatever we may call that, we should be able to call upon that at all times. And um, so I'm not such a huge fan of that approach, although I know that it exists and it's quite widespread. I think if, you know, if I'm a lover of Lalita Devi, she's perfectly capable of taking care of me at, in, under all circumstances. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. <laughs> so is there a way of being a Bach, like I'm just imagining an example of, of someone who perhaps isn't quite comfortable in some way with a, with, um, with a relationship with a deity form and 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 but they tend to feel that they have you know for example something like what you're talking about for nature or you know some other expression does it necessarily does bhakti the definition of it necessarily require that one that the that the object of that devotion is is divine or is it can it be something more secular well Everything is divine. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you look at certain examples, you know, in, in various bhakti traditions, um, if, you, if you think about how, you know, God is approached, right? God is approached as uh, a spouse, you know, or a lover, or as a child, or as a parent or as nature or whatever, right? Um, so the, the beauty of bhakti is that uh, the divine is available in infinite forms. So nature is, is like perfect and it, it doesn't have to be a deity. It doesn't have to have a form. And the reason that forms work 
is that most of us have, you know, we have, um, what do you say? We have created God in the image of man. <laughs> <laughs> so it's easier to think of God in our own image, right? Um, rather than something that's formless and infinite and has no attributes. And But that's where we get to anyway through this path of bhakti, whether it's to a deity or to nature or to your own children or to your own life. Ultimately, mm -hmm. we that is the, the goal is to fall into that formless, all-encompassing one. Mm, beautiful. Beautifully said. Um, okay, Kavita, I want to talk about um, your article um, that you wrote, Bhakti in Tarka, um, which, of course, the title of the, of the issue, uh, the title of the journal is Tarka. Um, and so this is a great kind of way to explain uh, how you explore the relationship between bhakti and tarka in your article. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, we ordinarily think of, um, you know, tarka as this, um, you know, like a rigid, um, a left brain kind of an activity, right? Mm -hmm. When you say tarka, it, it, you know, to some of us, it seems like it is not bhakti, you know, yeah. it is, Bhakti is very sweet and uh, more kind of soft, whereas Tarka is sharp and um, because it's discernment, right? Yeah. It's the foundation of, uh, or discernment is the foundation of Tarka, which is this perfected reasoning and logic. And we think of that as a left brain kind of activity. And um, again, you know, the example of this, I would go back to the Viveka Chudamani, which is by Shankaracharya, which is Viveka Chudamani means the crestual of wisdom. And so that whole text is about Tarka, actually, which is Viveka. A uh, little bit different, but, you know, you know, the, uh, Viveka is discernment and Tarka is logic. And and of course, Abhinava Gupta places Tarka as the highest form of yoga. And, um, and so this, this um, in order to even understand what Tarka is, right, which is the ability to um, discern between finer and finer and finer points that are distinct. So in my uh, language, if anybody is listening who isn't, who can speak this language, you know, I'm a cardiac imager. So, um, you know, in cardiac imaging, you have to, the, the ability of a test to differentiate between two tiny structures is called resolution. You know, it's called resolution. So um, it's called spatial resolution or temporal resolution. And so, Discernment is like that. It is the ability to distinguish between increasingly subtle things, such as awareness and objects that rise in awareness. And this is something that we can't just uh, fall into. You know, this is a process of having worked through other grosser forms of discernment. Now, remember what I said earlier, which is you have to fall in love with awareness in order to be able to know the difference between awareness and everything else that isn't that. You know, in, in, in order to come to the understanding that um, there is one that is everything, we have to first come to the understanding that there is nothing. So that nothingness or the emptiness is what leads to everythingness and the wholeness. Mm. And to be able to differentiate that, right? It takes a very um, sharp kind of um, ability, you know, to be able to say, well, you know, this thought, this subtle emotion, this subtle vibration is an arising in awareness and I am that awareness. And what is arising in me is not, you know, it is not awareness is the first conclusion we need to come to that it's an arising in awareness. And the eventually through continued self inquiry you come to this understanding that if it is arising in awareness it can only be made up of awareness. So 
first you come to this thing that nothing exists other than awareness. And then you come to the understanding that all exists in awareness as awareness. But that process is known as tarka. You know, that process of discernment is known as tarka. Now, if you don't have love for awareness, you're going to be pulled into the drama of your mind, you know, into the drama of the arising. This is called Maya, right? Mm -hmm. This is Maya because she is so strong. She pulls you into that, the, the arisings and everything that's going on within that and, and keep you from taking that step back. It's only when you fall in love that that process becomes natural, right? And it is through that heart opening of bhakti that we become aware of that awareness in the first place. Mm. You know? And to continue that process, because somebody told me recently when I was teaching a class, you know, awareness is boring. I'd rather be, <laughs> nothing's happening there, right? <laughs> Nothing's happening in awareness. It's I'd rather be in the drama of my mind because it's much more exciting. And so what I was, I was telling that person is, but once you fall in love with awareness, right? It's like being with your lover. And, and it's, that's a misnomer because there is no width. You are that, you are that subject. You are that awareness. And to come to that conclusion, it's like the, the feeling or the closest emotion that comes to that is love, mm. is devotion, you know, to come to that uh, understanding and the realization that I am this, I am that. And um, so that without bhakti, you can't really make progress, you know, in Tarka. Yeah. Because you're just, falling in love has to happen. Right. Otherwise, you'll just think it's boring and not worth it. <laughs> uh, or it becomes a chore, right? And, and the more you make this into a, a purely intellectual process, the more frustrated you're going to become because it isn't an intellectual process. Well, that's what I was going to ask next is that what I hear you saying is that this is something that's experiential. It's not merely cognitive in that sort of like intellectual um, discernment sort of way, the typical way we associate that term discernment. Um, so, you know, is is the falling in love something that happens organically and completely spontaneously? Or is it something that someone can work to cultivate so that they don't, you know, sit down and meditate and, and are totally bored in their meditation practice? Yeah, you know, it depends. And um, this is why, you know, the uh, whole, uh, you know, the whole issue of working with the deity is so effective um, because once you uh, cultivate a relationship with the deity, right, of whatever relationship, um, you know, like I said with Krishna, I, and Krishna is a perfect example of this, you know, of how, you know, if you read the Bhagavatam, of how different people had a relationship with him, you know, his he was a child, you know, this baby uh, that was, that still worshipped as a baby. <laughs> and, and a lot of people are very much in love with that form of him. And then, of course, it, you know, when he grew up in Vrindavan, all the gopis were in love with him as this young, uh, attractive and um, charming, you know, um, adolescent. And then, you know, of course, then he leaves and goes and becomes a kingmaker. And that is a form that I am absolutely in love with, you know, this politician and the peacemaker and the kingmaker. And then, you know, there, there are stories of people who had a relationship with him as an enemy, you know, Shishupala is a perfect example of that. And they were in love with him as an enemy. Can you believe that? Look at the contradiction there. Um, and all they could think about was Krishna and how much they hated him. And so, but it was their constant remembrance that you know even when when they die actually he kills um shishupala in, in, a, in a, a war in a battle and he is granted liberation because all his life all he could think of was krishna even though he thought of him as an enemy so whatever relationship with we have with the deity it is 
cultivating that love. It's like saying, you know, um, will you know if you if you choose to be in a long term relationship. How do you how do you cultivate that closeness and the intimacy and the uh, ongoing love with your partner, right? Isn't that a process? That's a process. It's not like we are given a manual along with that person and say, here, love him like this or love her like this, right? It doesn't happen like that. So, so too with the deity, you know, we have to cultivate a relationship and that that constant giving and this constant, um, you know, intimacy with that just, you know, is one way of cultivating this uh, love where you are falling deeper and deeper and deeper in love with the, with that. Beautiful. So you're talking so much about deity. So I feel like this, we might as well plug your upcoming course that yeah. is uh, happening in another month um, called Deity and Devotion. So right on the topic of what we're exploring. Um, do you want to talk? I know that you've recently, you know, you've decided to work with one deity. Do you want to tell those that are tuning in or that will listen to this later um, what they can expect from the course? Yeah. So this will be a four week course. And, uh, and, over this time, we will actually only work with one deity, but in this way of cultivating a relationship in various stages and moving from the dualistic, you know, from the, from the very external dualistic, ritualistic kind of a relationship to the more subtle and the non-dual relationship with the deity, um, where you experience oneness with that DT. So that's what we're going to try to explore over the four weeks. Beautiful. Um, well, I look forward to it, certainly. And um, uh, so I want to just mention again that the issue of Tarka that Kavita and I have been exploring um, is called On Bhakti, and it is available now at embodiedphilosophy.com forward slash Tarka. I'll let you take a look at the beautiful cover once again, the cover, of course, um, uh, designed or the whole issue designed by our, our wonderful uh, friend, um, Ryan Lemaire. And so you can get uh, a copy of that in either physical or digital form at embodiedphilosophy.com forward slash Tarka. You can also decide whether or not you want just this issue or you want to um, receive the other three issues uh, that will be happening this year. One is on um, ecology or divine ecology. One is on illusion. And another one is on uh, the topic of the scholar practitioner. So um, I hope you'll check that out if you're interested. So Kavita, as we close, is there any other kind of thoughts or reflections you'd like to leave our viewers or our listeners with, with regards to this you know, broad topic of bhakti? Yeah, um, I think, I think, I would really discourage people from thinking about bhakti in one particular way. Bhakti doesn't look any particular way. Bhakti is not about kirtan. It's not about bhajan. It's not about ecstasy and dancing and all of that. Sitting in meditation every morning is bhakti. Because if you didn't love it, you wouldn't be on some level. Um, listening to this, you know, even tuning into this is bhakti. Everything that you do for your sadhana, it comes from bhakti. You don't have to be doing kirtan. Trust me, you don't. Mm. That is not the only form of bhakti. That is only one. And by the way, I'm not into that either. So, uh, and I consider myself first and foremost a bhakta and, and, and then a uh, jnani. So, um, it, bhakti comes in your form, the way you are and the way you approach your practice, your sadhana. Whatever it is that you're doing, it, that love and the attitude that you bring to it, that is your signature bhakti. So I don't know where this idea has come from. Again, a very Western thing that bhakti equals kirtan or the Vaishnava thing. It's not like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, nothing wrong with kirtan. It's fun. No, but, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah, yeah. And I appreciate you pointing that out. Well, it's been great to chat with you, Kavita. And thank you so much for joining me, um, despite our, our technical challenges at the beginning. Uh -huh. It's always a pleasure to see you. 
And um, do you want to share anything else with um, uh, the listeners about what's ahead for you? Yeah, absolutely. My new book is out on the Lalita Sahasranama and it's available on Amazon. It's called Glorious Alchemy, Living the Lalita Sastranama. And I've explored bhakti there quite a bit because the entire tradition rests on bhakti. And um, I have a few um, courses coming up as well, including a one-year course on the Devi Mahatmyam that starts in the fall. So, Excellent. yes. <laughs> Excellent. So, and that, you can find that at, is it kavitamd.com? Yes. All right, so check that out. Check out her website if you're interested. Um, yes, your book is beautiful, and uh, uh, you can also see a little blurb from me in the on the fourth page. I'm very proud of it. Oh yes, <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> My first blurb, so uh, it was quite fun to do, um, and I was uh, delighted to do it for such a beautiful, um, uh, such a beautiful offering that you had written. So thank you. All right, Kavita, thanks so much, and thanks everyone for tuning in and. We'll see you once more tomorrow with Miles Neal at 10, 11 a.m. We'll be talking about pilgrimage and uh, bhakti. And, uh, and we will try to tune in on Facebook Live at 11, but it might also be YouTube Live as it was today. So um, you know, be sure you're following us on both of those channels if you want to tune in live with us. All right. See you tomorrow. Take care.